Hey, everybody. Good evening. Hey. Can you guys see us back there? Kind of? All right. This is fun. This is fun. Hey, Matt. Just for a little bit of context, we're very happy to be here. Yes. But also, we live <laughs> a couple blocks from each other <laughs> yeah. at home. And so, In this Richmond, is Virginia. very sort of a normal thing that not with the audience. But exactly. This, is <laughs> this kind of looks like your house, too. Matt has a ton of books. Well, <laughs> well, you have a lot of books. I do have some books. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> this is fun. Okay. <laughs> I, I dreamt up some questions for you, Nat. Thanks, Matt. Let's get started. Let's get started. <laughs> so, let me get a little more comfortable here. <laughs> so, f for me, coming into this record, uh, this was about sort of unveiling or showing who you are in a, in a bigger and wider way. I think you have... a a powerful creative vision, a very well-developed sense of art and aesthetics. And, and as a producer, it's just, it's about getting, it was about getting behind you and they're just, just getting, not necessarily getting out of the way, but just enabling you to be as, as the best version of you possible. And I think basically where that starts is, is just your listening palette, which I think is incredibly unique. And over the past couple of years since, the first record come out, came out, or since we, you know, started working together, you'd send me playlists or share songs or that kind of thing, and it's always completely off the grid from what most people are sending my way. Or I feel like your sense of what you like is just perpendicular to uh, kind of what's going on, in you know, sort of popular taste or whatever. I, I, it just completely different. So I just kind of wanted to start with, I was looking over the playlist today of what you made kind of to get us ready for the record. And I just want, want to hear from you, like, where does that come from? What are, what are some of those things and where did that unique sense of taste develop? Uh, well, I, I feel like I owe a lot of my taste to uh, my dad, who raised me on Motown music, and Motown has like a very strong song. It's like a very strong song form. Melody is like off the charts, groove, chords, and um, it's just like everything that, like a good song. It's just like a very good, simple form. Um, I don't know. I just feel like everything that I like about music has stemmed from that. Um, <laughs> And then I think a lot of it, and then growing up in, um, I don't know, maybe growing up in Virginia Beach, I feel like we had, Matt and I both grew up in Virginia Beach, Virginia. It's like a transit town. It's like a Navy, huge Navy town. So tons of different people move to Virginia Beach and stay there for a couple of years and leave. But oddly enough, Virginia Beach has a very strong, um, like, <laughs> uh, R&B scene, like uh, Pharrell's from there, Missy Elliott's from there, uh, Timbaland. Black um, Street. Black Street, oh my God, I was obsessed with Black Street growing up. I actually got, I was in tap dance with his daughter. <laughs> I took tap dancing lessons with his daughter. <laughs> and I remember like, I was like super starstruck by her at first and then we just, she's like the coolest person in the world. Anyway, we still keep in touch, but uh, <laughs> but going into like her mom's van and like there's TV screens on the back of the seat and being like, oh my god, like <laughs> it's pretty rad. Um, but <laughs> uh, I think just uh, I don't know. I I've always had a real love of music and melody, and I, I wrote my first song in first grade, and like I've just always been drawn to kind of like a romantic but with a groove kind of like I feel like all the songs that I like you start to see a pattern I think maybe yeah I think so yeah but but there's there's sort of an all like an like the Martika stuff or Evelyn Champagne or, or sure. like that kind of sort of a little bit 
deep digging on either whether it's like 90s R&B stuff or like late 70s kind of stuff like or like being very into the Bee Gees like <laughs> <laughs> like but but not in sort of an it's not ironic and it's no. it's not there's no sense of like um like there's I love everything about Michael McDonald like that is not ironic <laughs> yeah, yeah and it's it's not that's not like a new thing for you Mm-mm, that's no. like sort of a long term I remember I was songwriting with this uh, friend of mine in Nashville in 2009, and I was like playing him Doobie Brothers, What a Fool Believes, and I was like, this is the shit. And he was like, what? You know, like, seriously? And like, just kind of like wrote me off. Right. And where, so where did that come from? I mean, where, when did that start? I mean, I... I mean, I did, don't know, really. Well, I kind <laughs> of answered that already, kind, right? <laughs> I mean, okay, so like in middle school, did you love Michael McDonald? Uh, my, that's not Motown. Yeah, I guess in middle school I more liked um, like Blackstreet and Escape and Montel yeah. Jordan. And, yeah, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Indigo Girls. <laughs> yeah. That doesn't really come across. That doesn't on the come record. across. Yeah, <laughs> but my sister really liked that. I had an older sister too. I was so my. My sister has really good taste in music, and she also showed me a lot of like jazz stuff for the first time. So, Ella Fitzgerald and all, like all those v- jazz vocalists. Um, I always say my sister has like a way better voice than me, but my, she doesn't sing anymore. You know, um, she got me into like Dinah Washington and all that kind of stuff too. Yeah. Can we talk about jazz for a second? Yeah, let's talk about jazz. Yeah. <laughs> Well, this is sort of later deep in my questions, but since you just brought it up, how, how does that influence your record? How does that influence your singing? It's like a, sort of a joke that we are sort of a running joke with you, or we talk about it a lot because I think uh, definitely in sort of the world that we grew up in, sort of very punk rock, Virginia Beach world, yes. like to a large degree, like jazz music. And I think even now it's starting to be less so, but... And a lot of places, like, there's a, people have a hard time with the music. I mean, they just don't like it. It's not cool. It's, it's sort of looked down, especially jazz vocal, vocalists to a large degree. I, I didn't realize how much people dislike jazz vocalists until very recently, actually. I thought it was like, I was like, this is the best kind of, like, American music ever, is jazz music. And especially when you can sing it. Like, I don't know. So how, I mean, how did when when did you get into that, or how does it, and how do you feel like it influenced the record, or just because I know you love it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, it's a little bit of a soapbox. Yeah. Well, like, well, for instance, I mean, the easiest way to answer this question, like, clearly is so. After I decided to like, like, for instance, this is an example. Like, when Matt and I were writing songs together um, after the election and I was like I want to scrap that old record and maybe you and I can write stuff together Matt has a couple drum machines and you just play some beats that you had saved on there and then I would just start running melodies um, and then you would start to figure out what I was singing and a lot of the times the melodies that were coming into my head were coming from like a place of like from from like stemmed in jazz music um, I think like I've learned a lot about how to sing and my voice and where notes uh, can go within a chord um, because you know you can just play like oh whatever oh, yeah there you go masterclass <laughs> yeah you know you can just play a C chord but then you can sing like you can make any note really work over the C chord you know or any chord so it just taught me how to th- Think like I think like the most the person that does it the best these days in my opinion is Frank Ocean. Like I can't like where he thinks of melodies over these chord progressions like blows my mind. I feel like he maybe has this he's coming from the same place a little bit possibly, but um, and like you know so I guess it's just coming from that. Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> what what songs on the record do you think of as being like that? Sounds well, Hot from the Mountain for sure. Uh, what other ones? Oh, Ship Go Down. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Um, yeah. 
That one, it's like we've gotten a couple of reviews. Like we've been t playing some uh, of the songs live recently, and they're like, oh, Natalie and her snazzy, jazzy band. <laughs> And we're like, oh, is that a dig? Is that a burn? <laughs> well, I'll take it. <laughs> so, because uh, jazz has such like a negative, yeah. uh, you know, people just think don't think it's cool at all. Anyway. Um, so, in regards to your songwriting for this record, yeah, how how do you feel? How do you feel like you've grown as a songwriter from the first record? To oh my this god! Record? You talk shop a little bit. Yeah. So much. I mean, the uh, record that Matt and I did together uh, in 2011, uh, 12. I mean, you and I first started talking in 2010, I think. Um, I mean, I think I was still coming from a place with writing in Nashville, like, what well, was like fresh out of college and just still, like in college, I felt like I had the freedom to experiment with my writing, like, oh, this is my time, I can just do anything that feels good and like see how far I can take things or maybe I'll write like a pop country song today or maybe I'll, I was a songwriting major. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and when I got out of college, I was like starting to freak out, like. Can I just interrupt you briefly? Sure, yeah. For those who might not know in here, yeah. can you just briefly run down what a curriculum for a songwriting major is? <laughs> uh, and by those who might not know, I mean you. <laughs> me as well. Um, I did a lot of creative writing, music business. I took a MIDI course, um, <laughs> which is hilarious. Um, but then we also did like music history and... Um, That's not the songwriting part, though. Okay, it's so just in songwriting. Oh, yeah, like, oh, okay, okay, sorry. I'm just going through all the classes I had to take. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, in a songwriting class, it was actually really informative because we talked about like all the different forms yeah. that there are in pop writing because I, I was a commercial songwriting major. Um, and then we would do exercises where we'd have to like personify every single object in a song or something, you know, like, uh, I mean, I sort of bring it up because you're a really craft based songwriter and mm -hmm. you think of it that way and you, you res I mean, you respect, respect the craft mm -hmm. and I think you're very good at it. But I think for a lot of people, songwriting seems it's a mystery. It's like my dad asked me every time I see him, do the music or the words come first? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and like, that's the extent. So yeah. it's like, I think it's interesting to get down to like, the crowd just what what are some of the nuts and bolts of the of yeah of that? i mean there's still like i mean it was for a very long time um very like i had to be inspired you know to write um or i felt like that's how a songwriter is supposed to write to write good music but what college taught me is you know you have to write if you want this to be your life you have to write no matter what and as you get older, it gets even harder. Um, so that was like probably the most valuable thing I took out of being a songwriting major. But um, it's still like very, uh, I mean, I guess because I do it so often and I, I've gotten to know myself so deeply as far as who I am as a creative person and my process, like it's still, uh, there's still like an, an element of like, pulling something from like this magical, like kind of unexplainable thing about it. Um, Cause sometimes you have yeah, like, sure. sometimes you, it hits you and sometimes it just doesn't and it, it's hard and it's hard work and you have to keep chiseling at it to make the song into a thing. Um, yeah. So it's, how's I've, it changed? Oh, oh how has it changed? Yeah. Oh, sure, right. Well, Back then, I mean, the, those were all very, I mean, I'm extremely like emotional person. Like I'm very sensitive, like things like deeply affect me. <laughs> As you know, very well, Matt. I go to Matt's house like all the time and I'm like, oh, I just need to talk. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, but um, I guess now it's different because 
uh, I don't have to be deeply affected like I used to be. Like, like my last record was all very emotional, very like relationship-based music. And then I've been, you know, experimenting with writing about things that don't, aren't, didn't happen to me like personally or, or between one other person. Or I can kind of write about anything now, I guess. And I guess on some of the songs, like going through some of the songs on the record, like where do you think you could point out spots where you feel like that development happened? I mean, you know, like examples of songs where you're like, I wouldn't have been able to write this song three years ago yeah. or stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, I guess a lot of, I mean, sadly, a lot of like the new stuff, you know, half of this record is all brand, like, you know, at the time it was brand new. We were, Matt and I were supposed to be recording another record uh, in December of 2016, but then when the election happened, I just like, you know, decided uh, my problems are insignificant to what's going on. And I just felt like it was, I mean, it's, a, it's every artist's choice on what they want to do, and that's the beauty of being an artist, but it's, um, I felt like me personally, I wanted to contribute and put positive energy out there and say something and keep a conversation going. Um, so a lot of the new stuff, I guess I wouldn't have thought to have written Sisters, you know? You know, when you and I got together to write that one, I mean, I was in such like a hopeless uh, state of mind, you know? You and I had some really deep conversations for a long time, like a month before, you know? Yeah. Um, like a so, few months. Yeah, so the way it worked, I mean, just to give you guys some context on the, what, what happened, mm -hmm. was we were scheduled to record the last week of November 2016 and all of December 2016. And then when Donald Trump was elected on November 9th, Natalie called me the next day like, basically losing her shit completely <laughs> <laughs> and was like we we have we have to we have to move the recording session which um was a little bit more work than it might seem i mean everyone like mm -hmm. everyone was booked everyone's time had been booked out the whole studio had been booked out the label was expecting a certain due date there was just a lot of admin behind the scenes that like we had to go in and um really fight for like fight to get to get it moved but natalie was pretty much my mind was made up yeah it was just like this yeah. is what's going to happen so that, that helped and then we moved it to, to basically march and april the following year and mm -hmm. um which was only a few months away so it wasn't really that much time um and about half the songs on this record we had been already discussing and kind of dealing with uh, like short court and a couple more. Um, but then she was like, uh, I was already sort of tagged to produce the record, but we spent basically every day in January, she hit me up and was like, hey, do you want to write, write together? Which actually, weirdly, we had never done before. Oh, yeah, we'd never written together before. That was pretty crazy. Matt um, and I have been known each other for so long. Yeah, and that wasn't just, that was something that we had never done. And, she and was it like, worked really well <laughs> we're like how did we not do this before <laughs> <laughs> yeah so we ended up writing and it was we, like we did like two or three days and then um she was like can you do this every day <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. i was like yeah i can do it every day and so i just like awesome. we just blocked out every single day yeah. of january that's right and we worked every day mm-hmm <laughs> Because from like 10 a.m. to yeah, like, like five, yeah, like a job, like 10 to five every single day, yeah. and rode the rest of the record. Mm -hmm. And I think part of that was maybe you can talk about this a little bit. But part part of it was trying to get. I mean, writing political songs is hard. Why don't you talk about that? Actually, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you can talk about how hard it is. It is really hard because how do you? talk about these things in a way that's not too on the nose or 
could come off like a little, I don't know, just, you don't, you don't want to alienate any, anybody, I guess, or, it's like, how do we talk about this like really difficult, giant, broken issue in like three minutes and have it be singable <laughs> and danceable? It's actually a lot harder than it sounds, or, you know, uh, my, yeah, um, but my, favorite artist to ever make political music is Stevie Wonder. I feel like he's just the best at it. And um, he was my, I kind of just always kept him in mind with how kind he is with his approach to writing um, political music and how inclusive and just compassionate he is towards humanity just in general. And that's how I wanted to approach writing the new songs. Um, I guess sisters is a little like obvious where I'm leaning, but <laughs> it's a touch on the nose. It's a touch on the nose, <laughs> but I felt like this—that's what I needed at the time. And I remember with that one actually when because mm -hmm. we worked on the so on the the hook on sisters we worked. One of the great things about writing with Nat is that she won't let a section go if she doesn't think it, that it's right, which can be. I, I find writing with other people that's. A lot of times it's like, oh yeah, we got it pretty good. We got 85% of the way there. Mm -hmm. We spent an hour on it. Like, let's move on. Let's move on. But I think both of us share the same. We have a very similar sort of uh, temperature for like getting things right. And like yeah. the hook on sisters, we probably spent a day. <laughs> yeah. I mean, literally, like. <laughs> You're hook. You're looping the same eight bars for eight hours, mm -hmm. and it's just over and over and over and over again, which is sort of a hor It's ho horrible. Yeah, and then <laughs> <laughs> it's like a, it's a terrible thing to do to yourself. But I remember that when we finally got there was some like of the lyrics. Like, is all the all the like the anxieties start going through your head? Like, oh, I suck at writing. I, yeah. I can't do this. <laughs> at least for me, like, how come I can't just put that one little yeah. word? In that part, but yeah. I remember you were very in, insistent when we got when we got what it was. It was like this is what I want to say, mm -hmm. like it's done basically. Yeah, which is, you know, you're the boss in that situation. So it's like, <laughs> you know, all right, it's done. Great, <laughs> you can go home. Um, <laughs> yeah. Are there are there moments? Um, uh, I mean, are, do you have favorite songs on the record? Hot for the Mountain is my personal favorite, and Matt and I also wrote that one together. That one, I feel like, just blends everything that I love about music. <laughs> I really try to, like, I'm very conscious about, like, putting all of my, the elements of music that I just, like, love, I'm very conscious of, like, it needs to have, like, interesting chord changes, but it needs to be, sound simple. I like weird melodies and it needs to have a groove. And those are my favorite parts about music. So that one, I feel like it just show, it has like three verses and a chorus. Like it's really weird. It's like verse A, B, and C, and then a chorus, and then verse A, B, C, bridge, chorus. And it's just like a really interesting, progression and um, yeah, it's my favorite one. And I like the message a lot. The message is, you know, it's just don't give up and we're hot for the mountain. Like we're not gonna, we're just gonna keep going kind of thing. So kind of related to that, just to get on the political thing a little bit. Again, the way I saw, and we can get into this as much or as little as you would like, but Getting, getting to the record, recording of this record for you wasn't um, a simple process. No. And I don't think that it would be exaggerating to say that you almost, almost walked away like from music. This time around? Period. This time around? This record cycle? Last one. Or, you tell me. <laughs> Last one, yeah. I, th I mean, I was living in Nashville. I was just like, I couldn't 
get a break. You know, I was 27 and just like, I'm so old. And <laughs> uh, I just thought like, maybe I'm just not cut out for this. And like, ever, you know, Nashville, there's songwriters and musicians of all levels just doing it. And you're just still like working your two jobs and like, shit, you know, feeling really self-conscious, comparing yourself to all the thousands of people in Nashville making it work. Um, and uh, that's when I, I was really, I started a dog clothing company and that's when I was really considering like, oh, maybe I'll just do this. Like, this is my new life. <laughs> 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 because I made a lot of money, like instantly. Like that was the beauty of like making something with your hands and selling it and then instantly getting money. Like music is not like that. It's like you have to spend a shit ton of money and then like cross your fingers. Like hopefully people like this. Yeah, <laughs> kind and then, of. Well, and then coming off of that record, Mm -hmm. getting to this one was a journey as yes, well. Yes, I mean, this one, I couldn't believe it uh, because uh, we recorded, you know, the first record together, you know, 2011, 2012, and then it took a very long time to be released. It came out in 2015. And so I just felt this extreme uh, sense of urgency, like I need to write and record as soon as possible. And then, like, again, you know, things, I had kind of a crazy you know, year in a lot of ways, and um, it was just like my life was changing. Um, and, uh, and also I'm like extremely picky about like the music that I want to put out there. But the record kept getting pushed, you know, I don't know if you remember that. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> June, it was <laughs> yes, supposed to be I June of 2016. Then it was supposed to be to September, and then it was moved to November, December. And then... Much. And then, ironically, I was the one that wanted to push it further to yeah. rewrite the whole thing. But my label at the time, um, they were so upset. It was not easy. Uh, you know, they really wanted me to, um, you know, they had me, like, write in L.A. for a while. And that's something I've always just wanted to try, like, knock it off my bucket list. And I just didn't have a really good experience By writing in L.A., you there. mean not just be out in L.A.? You mean... Oh, co-write yeah. in L.A. Yeah, they wanted me to um, write with, like, a bunch of pop people, which was rad. Like, I just wanted to try it. Like, why not? I have this opportunity. I'll go for it. But it really didn't work for me at all. Um, there was one guy that didn't even know who, like, Stevie Wonder, like, they knew who he was, but they couldn't know, they didn't know any of his songs or Curtis Mayfield or anything. I was just like, what? And what am I doing out here? <laughs> Do not belong out here. Um... I had a couple like panic attacks in the closet then of the Airbnb. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. What, what? Also, like, <laughs> crashed the back of the car I was renting into like a pole. It was just like terrible. So much anxiety. Not, um, on, not on purpose. Not on purpose. No. <laughs> um, but uh, what were you talking about? Well, I bring that up because <laughs> it, it felt like to me very much. There was a certain type of, um, I guess I have two questions. One, it, it felt like this, the feeling of, for lack of a better word, like oppression that a lot of us felt when Donald Trump got elected. Mm -hmm. You were sort of dealing with twofold in the sense that you had an industry situation that was being um, very hands-on mm -hmm. with what you kind of, it's they like they were hands on, but they also weren't at all. But they just like wanted a specific, a very specific path for me, and they wanted me to yeah. work out basically anywhere but Richmond. They wanted me to work anywhere but Richmond, <laughs> so. which I thought was crazy. I was like, well, this is what I want to do, and I feel like an artist needs to work where they're most comfortable to make the best art. Duh, but <laughs> it wasn't so easy. No, so it was two, not. sort of a two part question. One. How do you deal in the broad sense of, like, we, we're we making this art, but it also intersects with industry. It intersects with selling, and it intersects with a whole whole team of people that that deal with your art in one way or the other. Like, how do you personally kind of find balance in making something because you want to make it, and then dealing with, with the music business, which is of weird fucking place <laughs> it is it's a weird business yeah i mean well all business is weird i guess but no, i guess especially it's not all weird when you're trying selling art is different yeah it is it's, different. it's a fundamentally different thing than selling 
um, <laughs> dog clothing, <laughs> <laughs> for instance. Uh, yeah, it's a balance. Um, you know, and it's just me. I'm a solo artist. I'm not part of a band or anything. So my team is very important to me. And um, I respect my teammates, you know, and um, I always want to hear people out. I'm always open to what people think. But if I think it's wrong, I'm going to say so. <laughs> you know, I have no problem with, I have no problem with, like, putting my ego aside to, like, think, you know, put myself in their perspective of how someone sees me, but then, like, like LA, I was like, yeah, sure, I'll go to LA, I'll try it. You know, I'm always down to just, like, try something out, but, like, creatively, because I don't want to box, I'm also an artist, I don't like boxing myself in at all. Like, if anything, I can't, that's the thing I don't like the most about being an artist, is I don't want to be just this or that. So I'm working really hard to make sure I can have creative freedom like at all times. But um, yeah, so like, uh, yeah, I mean the industry is strange, but it's like I, we also like, we all need each other, you know, right? It's like, I don't know how to do what the label does for me and they don't know how to do what I do, you know? So it's like a, there has to be a balance, and hopefully the people that you work with want the best for you and understand where you're coming from. And unfortunately, the label I was with before didn't really understand. My label didn't understand me. <laughs> wow, excellent. <Yeah. laughs> That's good. You know, it's just like, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I know, yeah. I'm just trying to get real right now. So, yeah. Um, not to... You know what this is like. Yeah, You're on Space Bomb yeah, Records, I do, Matt. I do Did know, you forget? I, yeah, I know. I <laughs> definitely know what it's like. It's, a, it's tricky. It's tricky, yeah. yeah. So speaking of Space Bomb, actually, this is, that was a nice segue. <laughs> um, so after Natalie's first record, which I was very much involved in and released and produced and uh i pr i told her over and over and over again like listen there's no like we didn't have any sort of business ties to each other mm -hmm. at that point and it was like you go do your do whatever you want to do like this record was successful it it was beneficial for both of us um but i it, it was very important for me that she knew that there was no I didn't feel like she owed me anything. I didn't feel like she needed to come back to Space Bomb to make her record. I didn't feel anything like that. And I probably, I might have told you that. You did. Over and over and over oh, yeah, and over again. Sure. It was, because I think it was really important to the art. I think it was, it was really important for our personal relationship. Um, just for that to be clear. But Natalie fought extremely hard. <laughs> All right, don't go tooting your own horn. <laughs> well, no, well, I, I, I bring it up <laughs> because did, it's funny. Yeah. You fought really hard, like harder than I did. I kept yeah, being like, sure. Natalie, like, they, don't, they do not want you to record here. <laughs> like, maybe you should go somewhere else. Like, <laughs> like, and you really put up a fight to, mm -hmm. to come back to Richmond and record. So, Well, I live in Richmond. Yeah, well, yeah. But, yeah. I mean, yeah. from recording right. other places. Right, right. Um, and again, you know, I'm not asking for compliments here, but why, mm -hmm. what about the Space Bomb community, which did, I mean, why did you choose to come, to choose to make it with us? For sure. Again? Um, okay, well, one, I thought it'd be awesome, like, after all this time for, like, you know, the first record, we did it. Space Bomb wasn't even, when we recorded, Space Bomb was just an idea you had you weren't even, you hadn't released anything. You were still trying to like figure out what being a label meant. Yep. Um, so we recorded the first record in the attic of your house. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I just thought it'd be cool, like after all this time, you have, you know, you've recorded so many records since you and I recorded together. 
I think maybe my record was what the fourth record you ever produced, maybe. Oh no. No. Oh. Second. Oh, second. Oh <laughs> Third, my God, maybe, really? If you count James. I thought Car Carl Blau was before me. Well, he produced his own record, basically. Oh, okay. All right, gotcha, gotcha. gotcha. Okay, okay. Carl. All right. Gotcha. No. Nope. Your record, your own stuff. Okay, James, James Wallace, Fish. who reunited Matt and I again, uh, and then. Yeah, and but I know how James works. He, yeah, that was very. James is very like, yeah, yeah involved. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so, I just thought it'd be really cool. Like, I felt like I had grown so much and learned so much about like, because I had never at that point recording with you guys never recorded with a band like that before. I'd always just built tracks by myself or with one other person, and that sounds very it sounds kind of flat, like at least for me, because I'm not well versed on bass and like I can get around, but I can't, I'm not like Cameron Ralston, like that plays in on these records. Like, so um, I was just, the first record I was just more like, more or less like observing what you guys were doing and just learning and soaking everything in. And um, I just thought it'd be really cool to, to come back with all of you guys and show how much all of us, you know, how, what, how diverse we all are and what we can do and, um, you know. And plus, like, I just, like, I'm all about, like, like I said, my team. And, like, I just have so much, like, well, I'm going to get gushy, but I just love you very much, Matt, you know. <laughs> Matt means the world to me. and you, and. Natalie. um and uh, I just really trust you, and you trust me, and that's really important as well. There's, I feel like I'm very, uh, you know, just as a, and I, you know, as a, a lot of the times I'm like the only like you know woman in the room when I'm recording, and you, and sometimes, most of the time, that's actually really intimidating, and um, and I'm a very kind of like read the room kind of person and you guys I know you so well so I'm very comfortable with you and I know you guys respect me and where you know where I'm coming from as an artist and you listen to me and I wanted to make sure like I felt that comfort you know with the second record because the second record is terrifying because you released your first one and then how do you follow up so everybody has so many expectations of what you should be doing next and you're never gonna like fully win you know so I just wanted to be in an environment that I felt very comfortable in yeah so in in the recording of the record uh, w were there moments that stood out like production moments like so the grind of the studio day was basically and we were there for a long time long time almost eight weeks 12 hour days 12 to 12 mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Monday through Friday 12 to 12 the band was there for about three two and a half weeks and then we had vocals and all kinds of stuff but that that's kind of the rhythm and it's basically like it's more or less like a song a day I mean it's something along two those songs a day well yeah I guess that's right is that how we yeah. scheduled it yeah uh, you tell me. <laughs> no, we did. Um, so we would start at noon, and then we would start tracking like literally like uh, twelve, ten, and then we would take a break at six for dinner. So we would track one song from like twelve to six. Oh, because we didn't do overdubs at night. We did a second mm -hmm. song at night. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and we took an hour break, um, and then come back seven o'clock to midnight and do a different a second song. Yeah. So. <laughs> Uh, I mean, what was that process like? Just a little insight into that from your point from your point of view. Uh, it was I knew what to expect, so that was um, really great for me. I knew like I know your process so well, mm -hmm. so I felt like it was easier. It was really easy for me to like s step in, and you know, at times. Um, yeah, I would I, I would say that was a big difference in this one mm -hmm. in the last one and we talked about it a lot it's mm -hmm. like natalie for for me it was a, i felt like natalie you just needed to 
get in there, get your hands dirty more because you have a lot of people, a lot of artists, probably the majority of artists that I'm working with as a producer cannot, don't actually know what they want and, and mm-hmm. what you're providing for them is a language and a vision. But like with you, I'm not really doing that. I'm not providing the language or the vision really. I'm sort of just sort yeah. of get in where I fit in, like give you good idea, give you ideas that I think would be a good fit. For sure. And then and vice versa. Just, just make sure it happens basically. Make yeah. sure it gets done mm-hmm. and gets done at a high level and run the day and that, that kind of stuff. But you really stepped in in a different way mm-hmm. on this one, which, which was by design. I mean, that's mm-hmm. what we wanted. Um, I mean, you would always, I would say to Matt, like if something wasn't going the how I was hearing it, I know she's like, no, it's not right. And you're like, get in there, like get in the live room. So then I'd have to like go over to Pinson, the drummer. And like, he has this great story. I just toured with Pinson for the first time, not that long ago in Europe, which we've never like played shows together before, which is crazy. We've just like recorded together. And he, he said this great story where like I walked into his drum booth and I was like, no, Pinson, it's more like this. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, got it. <laughs> I was like, I need you to hit that the crash and then the. <laughs> he was like, oh, okay. Like talking about music and explaining what you want is so stupid. Yeah. <laughs> it's really hard. It's, yeah, it is tough. It is tough. Yeah. Um, are there... Were you gonna say something? No. Okay. <laughs> were, were there mo- are there moments on the record from uh, like in there's like sort of you know when you're making record there's sort of like the songwriting moments in that world and then there's kind of the production moments. Are there moments that stood out for you um, just as we were tracking that were yeah. e- either interesting or fun or scary or what whatever like that when you think back on that process or think back through the songs? Well, I always do my own like background vocals. Um, and the most rewarding, the most exciting part for me was having the choir. These nine girls came, they sing in the VCU, Virginia Commonwealth University uh, gospel choir. And uh, these nine girls split into three, like, you know, you had your alto, tenor, soprano, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, is that how it works for women? I don't know. And uh, just having them sing my these songs that were so brand new, and all of them just like really getting into it, and singing in unison all together, and they were so quick to learn the material. I was really scared because I've never just had other people sing my stuff before on on a record uh, in a recording environment, and so you're really you're really like you're you're scared, you're like, this is new, I don't really know. You're still putting it all together. You're kind of insecure about it. And these girls like can sing their asses off. And, you know, I can sing, but I can't sing like that. Like, you know, that they can. And um, I was just, you know, just like, oh, do they, do they like the music? Do they like my voice? Uh, and it was just a lot of fun. And they were all so, they were so awesome. They were so into it, like dancing in the, live room and like came up to me after and they're like if you ever need a choir just let me know I'm just like yes like so that was probably the most fun for me so th- those girls yeah that was fun yeah this is a pivot but i i'm interested I, so the the question is what is it like to be a woman in the music industry <laughs> but i I sort of bring it up because yeah. Natalie and I had a, f- a very strange, there's a story that I, it was just unbelievable to me. Before we did her record, I was producing another artist and she was supposed to do background vocals. She was asked to do background vocals. Me? Yes. Oh, yeah. You were asked to do background vocals. Mm-hmm. And it, to me, Nat- Nat- Natalie doing background vocals is like a dream. It's just like, sing, sing a line, and she sings it, and it's in, she's perfect pitch, is in tune. And then you're like, great, sing a harmony above it. And she's like, okay, and she sings it, and it's perfect. And then you're like, sing a harmony below it. And it's just, it's like there's no, t- there's no time 
there's no extra time between like an idea you might have as a producer and like getting it recorded. It's really, really quick. And when we're doing if for your record, it's like we're flying mm -hmm. and it's, it's kind of this really amazing, just, it just gets built. Just, you know, you start a song and 30 minutes later, you've got this like shit tons of background vocals on it. And like, you don't have to ever redo anything. And <laughs> most of the background vocals can be, or vocals in general can be a, a, a incredibly, incredibly painstaking, but with Natalie, when it's not like that recording. at all. Yeah. So uh, you were doing background vocals for this artist. And so I was like, sweet, this is going to be great. Like now it's going to come in and we're going to yeah, knock out these like, vocals. I'll be there hour tops. Yeah. Maybe. Easy. Like just bam, 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 bam. And I was really excited about it. It was going to be cool. And you came in and this guy like just stepped in, in a way that I had never, I had never seen. It was crazy. Mm -hmm. Like, was t telling Natalie what to do and being kind of rude and didn't, mm -hmm. all the while, didn't know musically at all what he was talking about. Literally was, telling me to sing wrong notes. Yeah, it I was, was, like, a, it, sure? was a sure? it was just this total, like, you're paying me. All right, I'll, I'll sing that shit wrong show. ass note. <laughs> you want that <laughs> note? <laughs> I will sing it. Yeah, yeah. Where's my check? Yeah, she's singing. <laughs> It was this, it was just this wild experience, and you know he was an artist, so again it's like all right man like like I'll sort of get out of your way here. It was very awkward, and he was I just so remember, fired up. Oh man, who was? Not the guy. He was very mm. fired up, yeah. And so on the and on the way home, I I remember calling him, being like, I'm so sorry. That was really strange. Like I don't I don't know what happened, and you were like. It, I, I think it was because I was a woman, mm -hmm. and like, it, it, and I was just like, I had totally, mi I had completely missed that, mm -hmm. and and I, that when we talked about that for a long time that day, and just kind of like, damn, like you, like I, you know, because I'm not a woman in the industry, I don't. There's experiences that I don't see a you lot just of. Don't I have just don't have, and yeah. and. I remember we talked about it then, and then, and in light of the Trump stuff, like, and the Hillary stuff, like, we ended up spending a lot of time talking about those kind of things as it relates to the bigger picture mm -hmm. in the world we all live in, but also as it relates to the industry. And it was just eye-opening for me. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering if you could share. Yeah, I remember that was interesting, uh, you know, after that session, because I was thinking to myself, like, oh, well, that was just kind of normal for me. You know, like, it was weird, because he was literally telling me to sing wrong notes, but maybe this just, I feel like that energy, that was nothing new to me, and I know how to deal with it, and I know how to work around, like, somebody being overly pushy or, like, thinking I don't know what to do. And uh, I feel like a lot of women deal with that. Um, most of us, we have to just like, you know, stand our ground, but then we have to learn how to weave through these little obstacles that are constantly put in our way when we're being, when we're supposed to be the ones in charge, you know? Like, you hired me to do background vocals. That's what I definitely know how to do. Like, um, this should have taken me half hour to an hour tops, you know, but I was there for at least three hours. Ugh, it's the yeah. worst. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, uh, I mean, you know, I, I do, I, I've been doing this like a long time. I've been writing, you know, like I said, a song since I was in first grade. And I started like a girl singing group uh, in elementary school. And then I started my first band. And what were they called? I am not going to say what our name was because <laughs> it is so embarrassing. 
Okay, guys, this is so bad. But so my parents, we would vacation. I grew up in Virginia Beach, and we would literally vacation in Virginia Beach too. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'd never left Virginia Beach. <laughs> oh, um, and you know, we would rent like a beach house in Sandbridge. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Sandbridge. It's pretty nice. Uh, but uh, one of the houses was called Foolish Pleasure. <laughs> And I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what that meant, but like the wow. the the logo was really '70s bubbly looking, and I was like, "That looks really cool. That should be our band name." Oh my god, I've never told anybody that. How old were you guys? Oh, we were like seven. <laughs> I don't know why my my parents didn't say anything to me. Um, so I've seen like a lot of changes, you know? And then growing up in Virginia Beach, I was literally the only girl playing in bands. Did you realize that? Well, well I guess you guys had Sarah Carter. Yeah, we did. Yeah. But that was like the first girl that I saw other than myself, like. I did meet the, 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 day, the night that I met Natalie, we were playing a battle of the bands. And she, I was a junior in high school, which means you were. A freshman. In, a freshman. And she was the only girl, and she had on bright orange pants and a Ramones T-shirt. Sid Vicious. Sid Vicious. You correct me every time. <laughs> I always get that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> she stood out. That was fun. <laughs> and then I replaced her in the band. Yeah. Then you replaced me in that band. That, yeah, that, that I had. <laughs> um, but I just like, you know, in high school, feeling like. A little like I don't know I just got used to how like I studied guys like I studied behavior and because I wanted to play music so badly and I wanted to be in band so badly so I studied like the humor and the body language and like which is kind of crazy you know um, so I so I could learn how to like hang and it not be weird you know um, and I kind of got used to how um, feeling like, I remember it first hit me when I was like, oh, I get treated a little differently um, when I would, pl I would have to play with like, all the dudes in the punk bands and stuff because those are the only like bands in Virginia Beach at the time. Um, and uh, all like the girls like loved all the guys so much and then the girls like hated me, you know? <laughs> and the girls hated me and the guys were scared of me and like the guys thought the guys were cool and the girl you know and I was just like what this isn't f fair you know <laughs> um, but I just I guess I just kind of got used to navigating it because there's just nothing else that I really want to do with my time you know so but it's changing and that makes me so happy Oh so my you, God! There's so many that? girls. Like it's that? like it's like kind of it's like it's getting normal to see girls like in bands, like all girl, you know, all girls playing in a band together. Like that was not even possible to me, you know, for so long, which is weird. I didn't even know girls played electric instruments until I was a freshman in high school because I loved Motown music so much and like the popular girls on the radio played acoustic instruments, played um, acoustic guitar and piano. So when I saw like Jenny Lewis playing bass, electric bass for the first time, I was just like, what? No way, you know, blew my mind. That's cool. Yeah. So one last question, then maybe we'll do, take some questions. Mm -hmm. um, wh why, why do you make art? Why do you do it? <laughs> it's complicated. It's a fucking complicated question. Or maybe it's not. It's interesting to me. Oh, God. Because I think different people have different answers. Well, it started... Um, it started because... Hmm, I don't want to get, like, too personal, but, like... I was very much like a kid that like always stayed in my room and stuff and um 
And I didn't really know how to like, <laughs> this is, God, I'm not trying to like sound pathetic, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it was like the only way I knew how to like talk and express myself and like work through, like I said, I've always been very emotional and that's something that I've just, I've just, that's always been part of my personality. And music was always such a way that like I bonded with like my dad and my sister. And so I felt like that was a way that I could connect with them. So that's when I started, that's why I wrote a song so early. And I wrote the song about finding the last tulip on earth. Like it was like a post-apocalyptic song. <laughs> like, like I said, I was very just like a weird kid. <laughs> and um, yeah, and then from there, it was like, oh, if I write songs and like play in bands, then people have to hang out with me. <laughs> so like my, so you know what I mean? So like I got all the girls together in my neighborhood and I was like, this is how we're gonna hang out and I'm gonna be in charge. Oh, yeah. You guys, you know? And these are all the songs that I've written and you're gonna sing them, you know? <laughs> that was for the... The girl group, yeah. Foolish Pleasure. <laughs> foolish Pleasure. <laughs> how, and many, then, how many girls were in that band? Three of us. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Wrote a song about tomatoes. Wrote a song about being trapped inside a fish's stomach. Like I said, it was Biblical. very strange. <laughs> um, but we all had matching outfits. <laughs> um, so I guess it just, then from there, it's just kind of just, be, it's become part of, I feel like I've just grown, I mean, everybody, you're always growing and you're learning how you, your brain works and how you function in life. And like that for a long time, that was like the only way I knew how to like work through anything. So, but now I feel like because I've done it for so long, it doesn't have to be that anymore. It can just be like to put positive energy in the world. You know, now it's like I feel like I'm 32 now, so it's like I've got my stuff relatively figured out, you know, so. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like a lot of guys start music to w attract girls, right? Like, why did you start music? N not for that, but. Oh, why did you? Why are you it, an artist, Matt? Actually, it, I want to know this. Um. I don't know. I feel, I feel like it, it's something I, I just always created. I always made stuff. Mm -hmm. And I, I, think, I think about it a lot because I think in, in especially as, because there, there's a lot of like emotion, I think kind of emotional reasons, like same thing as you, like you do it to work through yeah. emotional things and it's, mm -hmm. it's sort of a, it's cathartic and it's a sort of a meditational practice that you can kind of go to. It's also something that, I was relatively gifted at compared mm -hmm. to other things. So yeah, it's, like, yeah. it's like, it's like you like to do things that you're good at, it's you know? naturally, yeah. But I think like as I, gr as I grow into that, some of that fades to some degree, although it's still true in some ways. But I think for me, the truth is, is like I just make it because I have to make it. Mm -hmm. Like I just, that's what I do. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I wouldn't be, if there was no music, I got, I say this a lot, but it was like, musicians aren't owed a music industry. Like if there was, just mm -hmm. because I'm, I'm, just because I make something doesn't mean there has to be an industry around it. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I think, I think a lot about it. if there wasn't an industry, if I wasn't able to make, I mean, until I was 29, my first record came out on my 29th birthday. And I didn't, up to that point, I, I had no idea that I was gonna have any sort of like professional career in the sense of like cool. doing this for a living. It was like, it was just something that I did and I just like nose to the grindstone kind of like hustle all the time. But my heroes were like like free jazz guys who like you know, <laughs> slept on people's floors and made $200 a night or whatever. Like right. that was, it was, that, that was like, I was like, yeah, sweet. Like yeah. if I can do that. But so the idea of having an industry wasn't ever, mm -hmm. it wasn't really on. See, you can be 29 and start a career, you know? Seriously. <laughs> it's true. And, and 
So I think now, I think about it a lot, just like if, if, if that part went away, like if there wasn't an audience or there wasn't uh, a, a place to put out a record, mm -hmm. it's like, would I still put out a record? And I think so. I think it's just something that I do, that I totally just have same. to do. And, and like the, mm -hmm. cr the creation, just the act of creation is a place that I go and I learn about the world. That's how I learn about myself. That's how I learn about other people. That's how I learn about my friends, all my closest friends, like I make with. Mm -hmm. um, and aside from any kind of commercial aspect of things, that's, that's like a, almost, a, it's a ritualistic in a way. Mm -hmm. and I think that's what gives me, you know, yeah. a, lot of, a lot of hope and a lot of happiness. Mm -hmm. Same. Yeah, my favorite is like going to a show that's so good and you're just like, oh my God, I need to practice right now. Yeah. You go home and you're like, I, gotta, I, I need to do, I need yeah. to get better immediately. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Mm -hmm. Shall we take oh, yeah. some questions, questions for a few minutes? If anyone has questions. Thank you guys for coming and getting a record. <laughs> if you do have a question, just raise your hand. I will bring you the mic. Don't be scared. <laughs> hey, hi. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so you mentioned earlier that when you were 27, you felt like giving up and yeah. doing your dog clothing business. Mm -hmm. I'm a 26 year old artist and hey. I guess I want you to expand on that, but more on the financial aspect of working two jobs that are your own independent jobs and making it work. Mm. Well, when I had the two jobs, I was working like two coffee shop jobs. <laughs> and then um, uh, and then a coffee shop retail. And then, uh, then I decided to do the dog clothing thing. So I did dog clothing and then coffee. <laughs> um, oh my God, I like don't, I feel, I feel for you. My heart is so like, like that stage of life like the early 20s mid 20s is like for me personally that was like m way more painful than like middle school or something uh because you know you, you just get out of college and you're just trying to like figure out where you belong and you want to do something that's not <laughs> there's no real no like set path um but I mean, literally, I lived in my friend's uh, uh, mother-in-law suite, and she charged me $250 rent <laughs> in Nashville, and that helped a lot. Um, but it was not. But it was not good. I mean, I was not. I was so unhappy, and um, it, you know, I was sewing for Third Man Records. I was so, like doing any random like sewing job I could do at that time. Um, yeah, uh, but it's important to remember, like, don't expect, like, you can't, ex you can't be like, okay, I wanna do this creative thing with my life, just that thing needs to happen, because that thing is not going to happen. Like, something over here is going to happen. Seriously, and you're gonna, like, I feel like, you're gonna hit rock bottoms, I definitely did. <laughs> and um, that's when you get this weird random opportunity and it might not have, you never would have expected it. So like, I got a call to audition for Jenny Lewis's band. And oh my God, I owe so much to her because she revitalized like my confidence because I felt like I had no confidence left at that time and like, Maybe feel like, oh yeah, I'm to I'm a great, I I can do this. I'm a great bandmate, and if I if maybe I won't be a solo artist, but I'll maybe I could be a. She got my foot in the door. Now I can be a side man, um, side woman. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and then uh, then just like like one thing after another, like just little things start happening and. You have to welcome the uncertainty. You have to welcome these weird uh, 
just any open door. And it's going to happen, like if you are determined, if your heart is in it, if you can't like envision yourself doing anything else, you'll, you know, I mean, I know, I guess I was like thinking about, I definitely was thinking about like quitting. I only told like my best friend Erica who did the um, album design, I told her and then um, told another really trusted friend in Nashville and that was it, I was terrified. Cause like, no, I am a, I'm a songwriter, I'm a musician, you know? And the fact that like I was thinking about giving up was terrifying. Um, so it's just like you, you can't, it, yeah, if you just stay, stay relatively on course, like something I guarantee you is going to happen that will show you that like it, it, you can still do this in some capacity, you know? Is that good? Did I answer your question? I guess you asked about finances. I was broke. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. I ramble a lot. Oh, yeah. Should I stand up? Hi. Hey. Um, so I had a question about with the what you've said is kind of like the rise of maybe all female or female fronted groups. Yeah. Um, do you feel like there's a responsibility with that to kind of emphasize that and talk about it, or is it more so like keep your head down, make great music, and not make an issue of the gender issue? I guess. I think it's really important to talk about. Um, I'm glad that, you know, Matt, you asked that question. I know that question is asked all the time now, but I feel like I was never really asked that question before, you know, until like very recently. And it's nice that like we're all talking about it now and we're all uh, realizing these things that these subtle and not so subtle differences in my experience and your experience, you know, um, so I think it's still important to, to always, um, you know, learn, keep learning because, you know, when I was like, like for instance, like when I was like, oh my God, I'm a feminist in middle school. I didn't know what that was. And I realized what that, what I've learned what that word meant. I was like, that's me. And I like flipped out and, you know, it's like, that's, yeah. But my relationship with being a feminist has grown so much and it's like fitting into my life in all these different ways and it's important like as a woman putting yourself out there and um, uh, just being a voice you have to uh, it's important to because my story is completely different from your story so um, and somebody out in the world that's like maybe she's scared to doesn't know how to do what you do or what I do, but will connect to what we're doing musically, maybe, sh you know, and it's just important to uh, always be open about it, I think, because I think, I feel like this hasn't, this hasn't really been, uh, in, uh, this hasn't really been in um, conversation until very recently, I don't think. Like, like it's normal to talk about it now, which is cool. Yeah, I'm still looking at Matt. I should be looking at you. <laughs> yeah. Hey. 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 <laughs> so, like, I know. Uh, uh, how do I phrase this? Starting thing sucks. Um, <laughs> so, basically, as long as I've personally been like, formally involved in music. I've also, in like either playing or ri writing, I've also been like really involved in poetry. And so I'm yeah. curious, aside from like Motown and, ja and jazz in terms of like composition, like sound conce concepts yeah. um, and like songwriting practice, have you ever gone into like poetry or literature, or, like reached outside of the kind of music box to uh, kind of develop your style in terms of just the writing process. Yeah, um, like like have I like gone in, into poetry and stuff? Yeah. Oh, for sure. Um, yeah. Uh, 
Nikki Giovanni, for sure. Um, she's a Virginian. Um, yeah, I mean, it goes hand in hand, most definitely. Um, Maya Angelou was also a musician. She started off as a musician before, you know, she, I mean, she's done everything. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, I guess I, I took creative writing classes or we had to write poetry and yeah, it's definitely something that I study for sure. Um, yeah, that's definitely a huge part of songwriting. I feel like every songwriter, like a lot of my songwriting friends are always posting poems on their Instagram, like their Instagram is basically just like a poetry Instagram. <laughs> because, uh, I mean, you listen to music to get inspired, but then you can, you read to get inspired lyrically. So it's just important to always ingest, <laughs> you know, to keep your mind fresh and to keep the ideas flowing. Um, because we all learn from each other, you know. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We got one last question all the way in the back here. Hi, uh, this question is for Natalie and Matthew. Um, as someone that grew up in the South, I currently live in North Carolina. Um, both of you, I'll be the guy waving my hand back Hi. here. Hey, Natalie. Uh, <laughs> um, as someone that currently lives in the South, and you guys have clearly had opportunities to move around a lot, I was wondering, with like the space bomb sound and everything that's happening in Richmond, Virginia right now, what uh, role do you see, both of you guys see yourself as furthering the community of Richmond, Virginia, even though we're in New York City asking this question. Yeah. I am uh, fascinated to know what you see your role is in uh, basically defining a community there. Yeah, I take my role in Richmond like way serious. You know that. Uh, it's really important to me to be involved in my immediate community um, and hire people that are around me, um, people that may not because I see the beauty of Richmond like well I mean I didn't really want to live in like an industry town anymore at that time so I moved to Richmond to like feel some kind of peace and um, I wanted to be able to walk and ride my bike wherever I could and uh, anyway but I just I saw like the talent in Richmond and um, I thought it would it's very important to me to hire uh, people from Richmond as much as possible to strengthen the community and to um, bring people together, you know? I think it's, I think that's like a really beautiful, important thing to do. And that's something that's important to me as, a, as an artist. But Richmond has a really unique sound because it's like this weird, like, kind of, it has a lot of influences from the North and the South. It's this weird, uh, it's a whole mix of everything. Do you want to talk about this a little more? Yeah. Yeah, I've been involved in, I moved to Richmond in 2003 and have been very active in organizing musically sort of under various umbrellas since then. And R Richmond's interesting because I always say that like, I really, I really haven't seen anywhere like, I didn't start Space Bomb because it was an idea that I was sort of, trying to fit onto Richmond. It was, I started Space Bomb because Richmond was asking for it. There is such a powerful musical community there that it needed, all it needed was a little bit of sort of administration and a little bit of organizing and I felt like it was gonna take off. It, 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 the community called for the Space Bomb idea and not, not the other way around. I don't think that I could move to hardly anywhere that I've come across and do what I'm doing in Richmond. It, it is, Space Bomb is sort of purpose built for the community that's there. And I, I think that, that's, in some ways that sounds kind of cold, but also I think that's what makes it, that w that's what makes it a powerful city. And, and the musical bar there is, it's like nothing, I, I've never been anywhere like that. And I've traveled a lot, never seen anywhere where people are that talented. And uh, Natalie and myself, to some extent, are more public facing than a lot of people in Richmond, but the community, we represent a very, very small 
part of the musical community there. And we're not particularly like, in terms of like local music scene, we're not particularly like huge movers and shakers. I think we both love the community and we both pay it, pay it a lot of respect and homage when we're talking about it. But there's, some, there's something a lot bigger than either of us that's going on there. And I, that, that kind of fuels me creatively and that's why I'm there. I, I'm sort of there because it's, it's giving to me more so than I'm there to give to it, if, if that makes sense. As somebody that has come into the Richmond scene uh, relatively recently, to me it was, it's a very small but mighty crew um, and everybody that's in our immediate friend group that like played on this record and are now doing stuff, most of them went to Virginia Commonwealth University for the jazz program and um, yeah, it was like you said, it's like you've just kind of, like for instance with Space Bomb, you've just kind of like given people like a, path to do stuff because a lot of people from Richmond will move to New York or for jazz but um, since you and this guy Reggie Pace in town were some of the first like jazz guys to choose to stay in Richmond and develop something there so Reggie Pace now plays trombone with literally every like huge rock person like uh, Bonnie Bear and Sufjan Stevens like it's like he's like you know, and he's such a, it's really inspiring. Um, and I mean, that's not, that's like no big deal for New York or Nashville or LA, but like the fact that like, there's really cool things happening in Richmond, which is such a small, 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 small city. <laughs> um, it's pretty encouraging, yeah, like you said. Like Lucy Dacus, I don't know if you guys have heard this girl, but that's, uh, yeah, it's like so much great music. It's uh, really cool to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks so much again. Um, I'm going to be hanging out over there. I have some new posters. Like I said, my best friend Erica um, designed them. They're so rad, but uh, we just got them like yesterday. So if you want to buy one, you have to pay with cash. <laughs> but they're there if you want them. Um, okay, so this one is called The Fire, and I wrote this one with, um, in Nashville a long, long time ago with this guy, Mickey Echo. Do you guys know him? But I know him just as Steve. Like, we used to sing at weddings together and stuff, and used to do background vocals for bands and stuff all the time, um, but then he just wrote a song with, you know, and Rihanna sang it, so whatever, that's cool. Um, <laughs> now he's like Mickey Echo, uh, <laughs> killing it. But we wrote this song together um, a very long time ago, and I couldn't, I remember really loving it, and I, but I could only remember bits and pieces of it, so I ended up just kind of rewriting a little bit of it. And actually he did, like he rewrote it, whatever, I'm not gonna tell that story, but anyway, here it is. of light oh we keep filling up the space between the branches and the sky oh but you and i we see no no nothing but the place that leads us directly to the fire all oh, this is now grief and joy elation sadness were meant then destroy a sparrow within all of the noise but our imagination keeps leading us into the fire We go because it's the only place that we know We will never be safe up and down, lost and found Oh baby, baby, take me right into your fire With awakened eyes, we met Never wanting to admit That we for so long haven't slept No, no, wanna feel it rise All of our love I went for a fight 
all my lost things reaching out to touch now but my gesture won't phase you can never get enough resurrection is within a clutch but our imagination keeps leading us into the fire oh we go because it's the only place that we know oh we will never be safe abandoned lost and found oh baby baby take me right into your fire oh but we can get higher Ooh, every time i run i just want to run straight back into your fire oh but we can get higher Ooh, when i say i'm done i just want to run straight back It's the only place that we know Oh, we will never be safe Up and down, lost and found Oh, baby, baby Take me right into your fire see i'll do this one this one i really didn't want on the record i was like i can't put that song on the record um but uh just because it it was written um about a time that in my life that i just really wanted to put behind me um but um i realized it's important to tell my story because people can there's lots of people that can relate so uh which you know i know that's like duh but um but it was just like a very like i was like no this person does not deserve any of my like nothing so but um anyway this one uh, but it's a, it's 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 a song and it's cool so it's, it's worked <laughs> I, I, I found like the reason why i should record it so this one's called lost turn up the fader it's like a lightning bolt we can't be saved so now i'm listening on my own once there was a time when you had me hypnotized you realized that your fingerprints are on my bones i can fall in into every lie getting pulled right back when i said goodbye
Thanks, guys. I really appreciate you being here and spending. Uh, the record comes out in three days, which is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm going to play one more, and then Matt, you want to come up and do one? All right. Um, yeah, this one also, like, Matt and I wrote together, and it took a very long time to finish the chorus. It, this was definitely the one where I was like, it's not done. No, it's not done. It could be better. It could be better. It could be better. And it's just, like, it's such a simple song, but, like, the simplest stuff is very difficult to, like, uh, yeah, it's like t you can't just settle. You have to make sure it's fluid and natural. Um, so this one's called Ain't Nobody. <laughs> I like when people like sing with the, an A, but they go, hey. <laughs> so, <laughs> cool. <laughs> All right. Ain't nobody. All right. <laughs> is chosen we need to feel this we need to feel this uh -huh. like an ocean nobody can steal this nobody can take this yeah oh no nobody can oh no ain't nobody can i'll take this from my hands and i know and i know and i know and i know that we're holding on keep holding on Who's letting go? Not you. Oh no, not you. Oh no, not you. And nobody can. Uh, sing out your voices. This kind of noise is one that rejoices. Uh, stand like a rock. I am the sources of my body's choices now. Oh no, nobody can No, and nobody can Take this from my hands And I know, and I know, and I know, and I know That we're holding on Keep holding on Who's letting go? Not you Oh no, not you Oh no, not you And nobody can Always giving it up. Oh no, ain't nobody here. Always giving it up. No, no, ain't nobody here. Always giving it up. No, 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 nobody here is giving it up. Oh, ain't nobody can take this from my hands. Oh no, ain't nobody here is giving it up. Oh, ain't nobody can take this from my hands. So no, ain't nobody here is giving it up Oh, ain't nobody can take this from my hands And I know, and I know, and I know, and I know That we're holding on, keep holding on Who's letting go? Not you, oh no, not you, oh no, not you Ain't nobody can, ain't nobody can oh, no, Take this from my hands And I know, and I know I know we're holding on, keep holding on. Who is letting go? Not you, not you, oh no, not you. Nobody can, nobody can, nobody can, no, nobody can. Thank you. All right.
I met. <laughs> I'm put. What'd you say? Oh, thanks, man. I grew up playing piano. Oh, thanks, man. It's really funny. So this is Archie Coates. He's from Virginia Beach too, and it's really funny, like playing like a keyboard like this in front of you, because it feels like high school right now, a little bit <laughs> with Matt here. And it feels great, yeah. Um, so this one's called Hot for the Mountain. This one's actually my favorite one on the record that I was talking about earlier. Um, yeah. Let's do a little, can we do a little faster? <laughs> Not my tempo, Matt. <laughs>